Dr. Bushholz is a world leader in urology. He has authored more than 300 articles and book chapters in world-class scientific publications. Trained in Germany, Switzerland, and Australia, he was the director of Stone Services at the Royal London Hospital and board member of the Stone section of the European Association of Urology. He now works in Dubai. So please welcome Dr. Noor Bushholz, who will be speaking about metabolism and common urological diseases, the prostate and stones. So the first one is the benign prostate hyperplasia, and uh, not too many, but I can see some of the men who now become very interested and awake. <laughs> because 50% of the men over 50 do actually develop prostatism, as we call it. And 20 to 30 percent of men reaching finally the age of 80 will eventually need some form of prostate surgery. So that's a huge amount. It's a huge economic burden with the huge cost, loss of work time if they're still working, and loss of quality of life, of course. So what happens in the prostate is the prostate forms hyperplastic nodules. They're periurethral. So when the prostate grows, it also obstructs the urethra. And this may, as I said, f look familiar to some of you, um, because this obstruction leads to intermittency of the urinary flow, a weak flow, nightly getting up to the toilet, urgency, frequency, the feeling of incomplete bladder emptying, and so on. We urologists, we differentiate between irritative symptoms and obstructive symptoms, so the irritation is mainly the frequency, urgency, and nocturia, and the obstruction is the hesitancy, the incomplete emptying, intermittency, and the weak stream. Now, there are two mainstays of pharmacological treatment for the BPH. One is the alpha blockers that relax the musculature, the smooth musculature around the prostate and the prostatic urethra, and the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors. So we have two pills. When these pills don't work anymore, then it's surgery. And what do we do? We basically make a channel inside the prostate to facilitate the urinary flow. And we can do that with the good old TUR prostate, or we can use lasers, water jets, put in a stand, inject something that shrinks the prostate, or do microwave therapy. So basically, we can freeze, inject, cook the prostate, and cut it. <laughs> so how does integrative medicine come into this now? Well, we know that the growth of the prostate is age and hormone dependent. We know that estrogens increase androgen receptors in the prostate. We know that testosterone promotes prostatic growth. We also know that in the prostate, there are concurrent inflammatory changes that play a big role. And we know that this adrenergic stimulation of the musculature, which worsens the symptoms. And lastly, we know there are regional differences. There's a lot of, as I said, 50% of men, but that is in Europe and in the US. If you go to Asia in general, the number is much lower. And if you go particularly to China, there's not much BPH. So what does that mean? That means there may be a role for naturally occurring hormones or hormone modulators. There may be a role for naturally occurring neuromodulators. And of course, there is certainly a role of the environment. Climate pollution, but we are talking today about diet and lifestyle. And of course, genetics and genetic modulators. Now, there's evidence out there for quite a time that metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, we have heard a lot of that, is connected to BPH. Other risk factors are cardiovascular disease, the race, and the family history. Now, we know for some time that the general lifestyle plays a role and that people, the people we were talking about for the last two days, those who have high calories, high protein, and high fat, intake also get a big prostate. And if you don't want to get a big prostate, then you better eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and put in a bit of exercise. 
Now, if we talk about lifestyle, then for most people, the first thing is they think about alcohol, smoking, and coffee. There are actually studies looking at alcohol and BPH and smoking and BPH, and they're all inconclusive. So some studies say, yeah, it's great. It's, uh, if you stop alcohol, you don't get it. Others say it doesn't make a difference. That's why I'm not talking about it anymore. Now, if it comes to coffee, coffee decreases the zinc absor absorption by 50%, and later I will show you that zinc does play a role in BPH, so that may have an effect. But coffee, as you all know, stimulates the adrenergic musculature in the bladder and in the urethra. If you drink a few cups of coffee, it's not very long that I find you on the toilet. And that's partially due to the diuretic effect, but partially due to the adrenergic effect on the nervous system. Now, cholesterol, a very bad word. We heard about it for the last two days a lot. We do know that there is a high degree of epioxycholesterol in BPH, and we do, we do know that patients on statin have a beneficial effect for BPH, so that tells us that cholesterol probably is a promoter of BPH. In addition, in cholesterol-rich food, we find a lot of arachinonic acid, which plays a big role in the inflammatory component of BPH. Omega-3, very popular these days. It works, of course, on the inflammatory component of BPH. And in addition, if you get your omega-3 from flaxseed, they are lignan fibers, and they bind estrogen in the gut. And as we have heard before, estrogen promotes BPH. Now, some people say the fact that the Chinese don't have BPH is due to the fact that they have soy and green tea. But some people also say it's due to the fact that they eat a lot of garlic and onions. And that may be true because especially garlic inhibits pathways in the cholesterol synthesis. And both of them are powerful or have a lot of powerful antioxidants. So again, these two may work on the inflammatory component of BPH. Now, let's stay with the Chinese. We have uh, the soy, non-fermented soy, and actually... Non-fermented soy acts as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Where have you heard that word? When I was talking about pharmacological therapies, right? So it's exactly the thing that the pharma industry puts as a pill on the market. So it blocks the androgen receptors in the prostate. But in addition, it acts as a low-potency estrogen. And what that means is it blocks the higher-potency estrogens competitively. So it blocks the receptors and the estrogen activity goes down. If we look at amino acids, people have looked at a combination of glycine, alanine, and glutamic acid. And these can act as neurotransmitters. And we have heard about the adrenergic action that worsens BPH symptoms. So these work, but of course everything that is a neurotransmitter works only symptomatically. It wouldn't shrink the prostate as such. Vitamin D is interesting because it attaches to its own receptors in the prostate and in the bladder. It has obviously an influence on prostate growth, but it also has an in, uh, influence on the contractility of the muscles, and it also has an influence on the inflammation. So it's pretty much an all-rounder in BPH. Now remember, coffee and zinc. Zinc is a lot in pumpkin seeds. Now pumpkin seeds have been given to men with urinary problems for ages, right? It's, it's, a, it's a home remedy. But what does zinc actually do? It acts as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Again, we're coming back to what the pharma industry sells us as expensive pills. Another heavy metal in food, cadmium, that does exactly the opposite, so better stay away of it. 
Now, phenols. Phenols have been studied extensively, not for BPH, for other things. And we do give, for example, cranberry in urinary tract infections. But it's not very much known that it works also in BPH, although the uh, evidence is still inconclusive, but it may actually reduce the symptoms of BPH. Now, there's a huge market of dietary supplements for BPH. It's really a huge market. And these are usually combinations, but the most purer one here is the uh, beta zetosterol, which is a plant cholesterol, a phytosterol. And that competitively acts uh, against the cholesterol and indirectly then becomes a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So that word comes again and again and again, right? Now, interestingly, people may take sol palmetto. Now, what is the main agent in sol palmetto? Beta zetosterol. And how does it work? Like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Same for stinging nettle extract. What's the main component? Beta zetosterol. And how does it work? You name it. We have two more important dietary supplements. One is the ryegrass pollen, and the other one is the African plum bark from the plum tree. Um, both of those act mainly on the inflammatory component of the BPH. So with all these evidence, um, what should we do? We should normalize the prostatic nutrient levels. We should restore normal steroid hormone levels. We should inhibit the overproduction of dehydrotestosterone. We should reduce the inflammation, the inflammatory component of the BPH and we should limit the promoters of BPH. So what can we tell our patients? Moderate exercise, eat a lot of veggie protein, lower your animal protein, you add zinc and vitamin D, and they may benefit actually from sore palmetto, ryegrass, and African bark, uh, uh, prune bark extracts.